Greetings and welcome to the Electromaker Show. This week we have some fantastic projects to show you, along with some things on funding websites and some fantastic places to learn online, and of course, the Mystery Box Competition. So, let's get going. We're going to begin this week's show by looking at a few projects made by people in the maker community. This one is featured on the Electromaker website and it is a recreation of the gloves from Half-Life Alex. And these are the gloves in question. Now, um, I haven't played Half-Life Alex myself, I don't have a VR headset, however, I did watch a friend of mine stream it from start to finish and I'm very excited about playing it myself, not least because of the so-called gravity gloves or Russells as they are also known in the game. The gloves themselves are both full of sensors in the game universe, but are visually meant to, I think, appeal to this idea of using whatever you have at hand to make things work. They are very rough and ready. And Electromaker user Efex put that to great effect while creating their own version of the Half-Life Alex gravity gloves. Now this project is super cool because obviously it doesn't actually affect gravity. Unfortunately, it would be very awesome if someone did actually come up with some gravity gloves and put them on a maker site. I think I would probably stop what I was doing and just make, make them and spend the entire day just tossing things around using gravity because I, after all these years, the gravity gun is still the best gun in any game. Um, I, I will, that's a hill I will choose to die on. Um, but this is lovely because this is essentially a functional and fun project using what looks like pretty much everything you'd get in an Arduino starter kit. There's nothing in there that I find too specific. It has a temperature and humidity sensor for sensing temperature and humidity. It has a pressure sensor for altitude, a laser sight and a distance sensor. It has both an OLED and a seven segment display and of course runs on battery power as the entire thing is mounted on the glove. Now this isn't a how-to guide, this is just a showing off thing, which is absolutely fine because when you've made something awesome like this, you should definitely sh share it with the world. And um, yeah, this is just a lovely project that I wanted to point people towards and there'll be a link to it in the description. Up next, we're looking at the Calcuduino from Volus Project. Now this is a Croatian maker and he has created a calculator using an Arduino chip and various other components. Now this isn't using an Arduino board as such, it's using the same chip that the Arduino does and uh, also using a similar USB to serial adapter along with a seven segment display and a bunch of buttons. Now the thing that's nice about this project is that it comes and it is just a quite nice little thing to own. Um, it's a very bare bones looking calculator that works using the Arduino chip that we all know and love. But the way it's been designed means that it be can be reprogrammed and repurposed. In fact, the connectors on the side of the board that you can see on the screen right now allow you to add various different things to it. And later in the video, which I will link in the description, he adds things like a potentiometer and a light sensor to it. The Calquino is available on Tindy for $28 and it has just gone out of stock at the time of filming this actually. Um, but I imagine it'll probably come back into stock relatively soon as it is a very popular uh, product and it is also just a very nice idea. While I'm definitely an advocate for people learning using breadboards and putting circuits together themselves so they can learn electronics, the scope of this project appeals to me. This is something that is uh, designed to do one or two tasks and of course by plugging things into it you can make it do a lot more. It is essentially an Arduino remixed. And yeah, with so many Arduino alike or clone boards out there, this is just a fresh spin on it that I thought was worth pointing out. So as I mentioned, this one is currently sold out, but you can join the waitlist if you want it. I know I will be and maybe I'll have a play with it on a future episode. Our next project brings us back to Electromaker and back to video games. Now those of you who've played Metal Gear Solid 4 will be familiar with the plotline to do with the Sons of Patriots, essentially an all-encompassing AI that controls everything to do with the military, both private and domestic. In short, in the game world, everyone was injected with small nanomachines that monitor them at all times, and this is how they can control how weapons are used or not. And this is exactly what 314 Reactor has created, albeit using a Nerf gun and not nanomachines because we don't have access to nanomachines as makers yet. In what is a complicated but very well realized project, 314 Reactor has taken a stock Nerf rifle and fitted it out with various sensors and a Raspberry Pi Zero and an Arduino in order to ape some of the functionality that the SOP uh, nanobots have in the Metal Gear Solid game. As it says here, the key goals were to make a Nerf blaster that can only be fired by users with an authorized fingerprint, be able to get sensor data on the user and the environment around them, and to be able to remotely administer the system. This is done via a fingerprint sensor, along with a GPS tracker and various others, along with a Raspberry Pi Zero and an Arduino. 
Now the scope of this project is just bananas. Um, it really is a fantastically thought out and well-made project. Um, I can't go into all the details here because it would take far too long, but I absolutely suggest that you check out the article on Electromaker uh, as this is a long and detailed tutorial as to how you can mod a Nerf rifle to turn it into something which is just, it's just it's got so many features. It's just amazing. I'm kind of blown away by this one. I'm not gonna lie. Um, yeah. Uh, there's a video that goes alongside it as well, uh, which uh, takes you through uh, various elements of how it was built, along with some of the software too, in some detail. But this is a truly fantastic project, and uh, 314 Reactor, I would take my hat off to you if it wasn't literally a part of my head. Up next, an Instructables from Coders Cafe, which uses the LEGO Mindstorms EV3 programmable brick, along with Alexa, to make a completely hands-free chessboard. Now this is both a wonderfully simple and incredibly complex project all in one, but it, it, it's coming down to a few very simple principles that I think are so wonderfully thought out. It's definitely worth having a look at and definitely worth reading through. It's a very well-written and long instructable that goes through how this machine works, which is essentially a robot with a magnet on it which can move these pieces around. Now, as you're seeing in the video right here, um, they can move normally from place to place, but the problem that could cause is that if you're, for example, moving a knight or when the game is a little bit further on, you could end up hitting other pieces. And uh, they've got around that in a really simple but really elegant way. Now the way they've got around collisions is by moving pieces to the corner of the tile and then moving to the desired location and then moving to the center of the target tile, which is an incredibly simple and very, very elegant way of doing it. Along with giving build instructions for the Lego side of things, there is also a quick build instructions for the case that they have made and how to set up the Alexa skill to make it voice activated. Now this definitely falls into the category of interesting things to read because I don't think I'm ever going to build this myself, but it really is a fantastically put together Instructables and I learned a lot just reading through it despite the fact that I don't have any of the Lego Mindstorm stuff and I doubt I'll ever build this myself. One final thing before moving on, um, if you were at all interested in how Alexa works with single ball computers and how you can do that yourself, this is a fantastic article to read. Um, even if you have no intention of using Lego Mindstorms or setting up your own chessboard, uh, reading this is good and it's inspired me to dig out my Alexa that has been gathering dust and see if I can make it talk to my Raspberry Pi again. I highly recommend reading through this project and there will be a link to it in the description of this video. Another thing that caught my eye this week was a video from the always fantastic Low Spec Gamer. If you're not familiar, this is a channel where he basically takes apart modern games and makes them work on increasingly smaller amounts of hardware. Um, I remember back in the day using some of his ticks and tricks to get Rocket League working on my, at the time, horrendous laptop. This episode is about the Raspberry Pi 4, and it's about what games you can get running on it now. Now, of course, there are a bunch of games you can already play on the Raspberry Pi by using an emulator. There's a reason why Raspberry Pis are so popular as emulation devices, because they're small and they can fit anywhere. Uh, but this is slightly different. This is playing games natively on the Raspberry Pi. And the game that he showcases first in this video is Doom 3. Doom 3! Now, at the time Doom 3 was released, my main computer would not run Doom 3. But uh, yeah, uh, apparently the source code must be out there because it's a uh, Raspberry Pi is an ARM computer. You can't run x86 things on, uh, on a Raspberry Pi. You have to uh, uh, recompile it uh, for ARM. And as the video shows, this is exactly what he did. This was done using the Doom 3 source port. Now, bear in mind, you do need to own a copy of Doom 3 to do this. The game files aren't included. And uh, he gives you the code you can use to cross compile it to ARM. And it seems to run pretty well. And a frame rate jumping between sort of just below 30 FPS to 60 FPS is absolutely acceptable. In fact, that's how I played almost every game when I was young. I never had computers that were good enough to run most games. So this is kind of nostalgic for me. And of course there is uh, Minecraft because Minecraft. No, this is the actual full version of Minecraft on a Raspberry Pi, rather than the Pi version of Minecraft on the Raspberry Pi. And of course, anyone who's played Minecraft will know there is a very large difference. The video also features how to run Celeste and a couple of other games, and the entire channel is a treasure trove of information about how games work and how to get them running on lower specs. And even if you weren't going to do it yourself, it's definitely a channel I would advise subscribing to for its educational content alone. <laughs> Moving on to education, and um, an article that I read this week uh, with the title Teaching AI to Fourth Graders is a Thing Now uh, caught my eye for numerous reasons. Now the article is about Jesse Jiang, whose name I'm probably mispronouncing and I apologize, who, um, who used to be a Google product manager who worked for Google for several years and um, came up with a curriculum for her own child in order to teach them about AI from a relatively early age. 
which is what we should be doing, by the way. AI is completely shaping our world. Kids need to know about it as early as possible because the fundamental concepts that AI runs on are actually quite easy to understand. It's when you get under the, underneath it all and actually look at how it works that it becomes horrifyingly complicated. She is the founder of Create and Learn, which is an education platform bringing technological concepts to younger minds, and they are running a number of online summer camps. Now, I'm mentioning this now because all of these courses are currently 50% off due to the current global crisis, and they are fantastic courses. Anyone who's used Scratch before will understand why it's so good for kids, because it's block programming and it makes programming concepts very easy to visualize. But this goes further than that. It teaches kids about AI, about uh, programming mobile apps, about how robots work, all things which you're usually not going to look into, at least until the end of your school career, maybe not until you end up going to university. But getting these concepts in early so children understand how technology interacts with their world is something that I think is fantastic. Another point about this that I think is worth mentioning is that by design these are small classes. Um, there's only a few students per class, they run several summer camps throughout the summer um, and while I have no hands-on experience of this I'm going purely by trust. The amount that they are asking for what they are offering seems to be absolutely fantastic and if you have kids this is something that I would definitely look into. As always there'll be a link to this in the description. Create and Learn also provide free material online. Um, all of their open online classes have been archived on the website and there are recordings of past events which are tailored for children. I would strongly recommend checking them out. Speaking of free online resources for learning, classcentral.com has a massive list of resources that have been made free or at least very cheap due to the coronavirus crisis. Uh, there is too much stuff for me to even start going through here. But needless to say, um, every large American university and every large learning website is represented here in one way or another, along with some stuff that you would never even think of. Um, I will leave it to you to dig through this list, but not only is this a fantastic time to start learning something new, um, people are making it easier than ever. So um, I will leave a link to this one in the description. And if you do find anything in here that you end up studying, please let me know about it. I haven't even had the chance to go through this list myself to see if there's things I want to start learning yet, and I don't think I'm going to have the time. But this is, this is lovely. This is a fantastic gesture to people at a very, very difficult time. And uh, yeah, get in there. See if there's something you want to learn. Speaking of educational content, Andreas Spies is a YouTuber that I have featured on this show various times. Most of you probably know who he is already. If not, he is an absolute authority on maker boards and sensors, and a lot of what I have learned about Arduino, I have learned from him. A recent video of his covers DC power. Um, getting power for projects is something that's a kind of ongoing problem for lots of makers. You can either get an expensive power supply or use a bench power supply, or you can try and get a cheap one, but then you run the risk of it not potentially working very well or being unsafe. Now, rather than explain the entire video to you, this video is about server power supplies. And in fact, as soon as I watched the video, I immediately ordered one because this was a tenner. However, I believe this to be safe because this is actually a server power supply that has been used and they, can, they cannot fail. They have to be used to a very high degree of safety and they are always replaced early. I think this is a fantastic idea. I can't believe I hadn't thought of it myself. I will leave a link to the video in the description. If you do want to do this for yourself, I do it fairly quickly because I imagine these things are going to start selling like hotcakes just because of how cool this video is and because of how convenient this is going to be for powering, well, everything. It's the middle of the show, which means it's time for the mystery box competition. Now, uh, for those of you that have never watched the show before, we have a mystery box that is filled with prizes that you can win. Now, the mystery box might not contain things you actually want to win. For example, there may well be shields to microcontrollers that are no longer available or random strange microcontrollers that never really took off and that have no documentation. This is why it is called the mystery box competition. So um, whatever you win, it could be something fantastic. It could be something absolutely and utterly useless. I feel like we've been sort of lucky so far, but we'll find out. Uh, anyway, the way this works is I pick a prize and then I pick a winner from the comments from last week's show. So let's pick a prize from the mystery box. So this time I want to go, like last time I was sort of back left corner, I'm going to go straight down the middle this time. And yeah, that feels like a, that feels like a thing. What do we have here? Silicon Labs. Sensor Puck. What are you? What are you? Ooh, do you look at that? Ooh, I like this. I like this thing. I like this thing a lot. I have no idea what it is, but it... Yeah, it's got, it's got a little coin battery on the back there. It's got various sensors on the front. It's got a, what chip is that? EFM32. I am not familiar with that microcontroller. All right, as is customary, I'm gonna look it up quick. 
yeah, okay, this thing is super awesome. Um, this is a Bluetooth low energy sensor puck, which is designed to integrate with mobile phones. It has an iOS and an Android app, and um, yeah, it has a little coin battery on the back. Uh, if I turn it on, you'll see that the uh, LED flashes for a second like that. And when I put my finger here, it will change color and it will start flashing red. And that is my pulse. So yeah, uh, this is a cool little thing. Um, you can develop for it as well, although again, like I say, some of these prizes do come with a caveat. Um, if you want to develop for it, you will need to get a little JTAG connector thing here, which unfortunately this kit does not come, uh, come with. But yeah, this is a lovely little device, something that I would love to play with if I had the time to. However, I can't because one of you will be winning it. And now we need to choose a prize winner. So in order to choose a prize winner this week, rather than come up with some convoluted machine to pick a random number, I thought I would take the opportunity to share a YouTube channel that I love that has nothing to do with tech whatsoever. So, as usual, all of the names that entered the mystery box competition went into an Excel spreadsheet and all of those names were randomised. And now all I need is a random number to pick from that random-ish list. And to do so, I went to Krug Smash, which is a YouTube channel telling stories about Dwarf Fortress. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar, Dwarf Fortress is an absolutely wonderful world simulation game. It's very difficult to categorize it. And I think one of the only reasons it isn't more famous is because it's an uh, ASCI game. There's no graphics to speak of, although you can get graphic tile sets. Anyway, he has been telling a beautiful story of Scorch Fountain, which is a fortress uh, where many dwarves live and die and many things happen. And uh, I decided I'd go to the latest episode of Scorch Fountain and take the final digit of the number of views it has in order to pick a prize winner. And that final digit was six. And number six on that list was Patrick Johansson. So congratulations, Patrick. We'll be in touch with you as to how you can claim your prize. If you would like to enter the mystery box competition, it's going to be a lot easier going forward. Essentially, anyone that leaves a comment on this video will be in the running for winning what is in the mystery box next week. You don't need to write anything specific, just any comment will do. Although, of course, it would be lovely if you could tell us what you think of the show, or just tell us what you're into. If there's a specific part of Maker or embedded uh, programming or making, or whether it's the electronic side, whether you like 3D printing, we'd love to know what you're interested in, so please leave comments about that, and you'll automatically be entered into the competition. Anyway, that is enough mystery box for this week, so let's get on with the show. Never gets old. Up next, an update to the command line interface for the Arduino IDE. Now, those of you who've been following Arduino for a while are probably uh, familiar with the fact that they've been working on this interface, but it's just received a significant-ish update. Um, rather than just go through all of the new features, which um, if you're interested in this, I'm sure you will do yourself, um, although now you can uh, burn bootloaders on the command line, you can use external programmers, all kinds of nice things that power users have been asking for. But the first thing that um, kind of uh, came to mind for me when I heard that they were doing this was the idea of being able to use a Raspberry Pi in headless mode as a way to program Arduino boards. Uh, this is something that has been possible to do in the past, it's just been a real uh, pain to do. So I downloaded it and I've been having a bit of a fiddle with it. So um, first things first, here it is just in the Windows PowerShell. Um, and so if you run it, it will give you a whole load of options that you can, uh, that, that you can do with it. Now, um, just as a kind of one small example, which is something that I think is maybe worth pointing out to anyone that gets this, um, if I type out core and list, this is uh, the support for boards. So essentially, this is like your board manager in the Arduino IDE. And much like the board manager, you can add boards to it. Um, but when you first install the command line interface, uh, you won't necessarily have this, which I can show you actually by moving over to Linux. Now, uh, this is just the Windows subsystem for Linux, but um, I'm using this as my sort of ersatz Raspberry Pi terminal. And if I do the exact same thing here and uh, run it, oh, well, let's just run the thing again. Um, I'll do a new CLI and then say core list. There were errors loading platform indexes because it isn't there. Um, now, there is a fantastic video from Arduino that takes you through everything that you will need to know um, from getting set up in the first place to uh, running sketches and many, many more things. It's something I definitely will be having a bit of a fiddle around with because, um, yeah, the idea of being able to just uh, be in a headless pie and, for example, just be able to type, uh, how, do you, how do I do this? New sketch, perhaps? New sketch. Uh, motor, let's say, unknown command. And again, like all good CLI programs now, I just say, uh, if I type sketch, will that tell me? Arduino sketch commands. Uh, sketch, I just had it the wrong way around. 
So I'm wasting your time by doing this, but I'm just gonna say motor. It's created a motor, CD motor. And let's see what's in here. Uh, motor, oh, I, 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 I can't speak and type at the same time. And there we go. So, sorry for my waffling on and typing while trying to be on camera. I can never do two things at once at the same time. But what you have here is Arduino in Nano in a command line, which means that you could have your Pi on the other side of the room plugged into an Arduino if you needed to, or any other uh, headless box that had an Arduino plugged into it. You could set up your Arduino with a Linux server box and have that Arduino plugged into anything. And you essentially now have a nice long distance way of programming and uploading to an Arduino, which is something that I just thought was kind of cool. Just before moving on, of course, I'll be linking this blog post in the description for the Arduino command line interface. Um, if you just want to go for it and get it, head to Arduino's uh, GitHub and head to the Arduino CLI uh, section of it. And uh, uh, you, there is uh, yeah, a place to install it and also the getting started guide, along with the commands reference and everything else that you will need. Now, despite the fantastic blog piece by Jeff Pounder that we featured in last week's show about setting up your Raspberry Pi and booting from the external hard drive, along with overclocking, I've had a couple of people this week ask me if I can go through how to do the uh, USB booting on the Raspberry Pi. And it isn't something that I have time to do on this show. We have to move fairly quickly or maybe do a separate tutorial on it one day. But for now, let me point you in the direction of Jeff Gearling. Now, um, he is a YouTuber and blogger who's been doing a lot of stuff about Raspberry Pi recently. He's done some fascinating videos on making Kubernetes clusters out of Raspberry Pis, or Kubernetes. I don't know who pronounces it either way. It's Kubernetes as far as I'm concerned. Um, along with, yeah, um, having uh, using those uh, clusters to do fun things, like uh, set up a Pi hole and have a Minecraft server and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, he has recently released a video on how to boot the Raspberry Pi 4 using an external SSD. Um, it is very well put together. It is very easy to follow. Um, I will be linking the video in the description. And as well as the video, he also has a very extensive blog on the subject. So um, rather than just point you back to that same Les Panda article from last week, although I do hope you do read it, um, I thought I'd point you in the direction of yet another fantastic Raspberry Pi YouTuber. And now back to one of our favorite sections, things that are on funding websites currently being funded, apart from the things that haven't started being funded yet on funding websites and a few things that aren't on funding websites, they're just for sale. Names, names, names. And first from Crowd Supply, something quite special actually. Um, this is the ZS1100A power meter, also names. This is a power meter which is very accurate at reading very small amounts of power. Now you might wonder why that's important, but anyone who's working in IoT or any kind of embedded hardware that needs to work for a very long time on a very small amount of power will understand how important that is. You need to know how much power your device is using. You need to know how much rough battery power you can expect while you are developing. Now, these things aren't anything new. They exist in the industry, but they are incredibly expensive. This kit is $499. Now, I know that sounds like quite a lot of money to, to a lot of us, but for what it is, that is fantastic. It really is. Um, and yeah, um, again, I could geek out and go through all of the figures and facts of what it can do, but realistically, all, if anyone's tried in the past to, to measure the power supply of one of their own uh, projects that is very low power, you'll realize that it's not actually particularly trivial to do, and this seems to absolutely cover all the bases. The crowd supply page itself takes you through all the things that it can do, and the reasons why you might want to use it over, say, a multimeter or an oscilloscope, um, and yeah, as I mentioned, $499 might seem like quite a lot. And I know this is fairly niche. This is probably the first thing on crowd supply that I'm talking about that I haven't instantly said, yes, oh, I really want to get this and backed because uh, generally if I want something to succeed, I will back it. Um, however, this is, this is so high above my pay grade that I don't think I can, but I really, really want this to succeed. Um, so if you are working on IoT as a hobby, or even if you are working at it in the industry, this is something that is definitely worth a look. There'll be a link to it in the description of this video. Next up, Pixie. Now, Pixie are chainable little micro LED screens. They're five by seven and they're one color and they're very simple, but they're just very beautiful, very lovely, very well made. Uh, they're unfortunately sold out. Um, I saw these uh, earlier last week or uh, just after last week's show when they were still in stock then and I earmarked them to talk about and sadly they've sold out since then, but I imagine they'll come back. But look, oh, they're lovely. These are little modular things that just clip together and you can use as many of them as you want. 
um, and their i2s as well so you can use two leads on your arduino plug into one of the lixies chain as many of them together as you want i think there is a limit but it's about 24 or something and control all of them from just two pins of your arduino now, as someone who has tried to make his own LED like screens before and has tried to make LED walls and programmable this and that with relative degrees of failure, um, this is such a lovely idea. And as soon as I come back into stock, I would like to get a few. Now, um, it is worth noting that um, $14.99 is the cost of one uh, Lixie module. So that's this that you are seeing here. Um, and so they aren't as cheap as some of the you know more do-it-yourself options, but if you just want something that works well and that has a, a, a very robust library already, and as I say, it just takes out only two pins of your Arduino, this is a fantastic thing. I absolutely understand the irony of showing a YouTube video on a YouTube show. This is being doubly compressed, but this video that they put up just to give an example of how smooth they are is just lovely. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can see from that that these things are very responsive and my immediate idea for them would be to actually chain them all together like that and to try and make some kind of weird and bizarre one color pixel two player game. But uh, yeah, that's something for the future maybe. By the way, if the branding of Pixie uh, and the fact that it's from Lixie Labs sounds familiar to you, that's because they're the people who were behind those uh, fantastic Lixie lights that made such a splash some time ago. Now, what we're looking at here is actually the Lixie Mark II, um, but they work in a sort of similar fashion, and they were designed to be a, a, a sort of better alternative to Nixie tubes. Um, and uh, as you can see, the Lixie II is on sale as well, and also out of stock. I guess these people are making things that people want quite a lot. And finally today, a board on Crowd Supply that hasn't launched yet, but I am very excited about. This is the three dot board from Humans for Robots, and it is a board for building robots, as they say. Uh, this is very much an all-in-one project that I think is really well thought out. As you can see, there is a battery built right into the PCB, and that is a rechargeable battery that recharges via the USB connector. That same USB connector can be used to program the chip, and the chip is the same chip as the Arduino Micro and Leonardo. Therefore, the board is compatible with the Arduino IDE. It also supports up to two motors with the onboard motor driver, and it has Bluetooth 5 connectivity, so it's pretty decent. Like, what? I can't think of what else you would want it to have. I... Yeah, it looks good. Looks good. Um, obviously, no idea how much this is going to cost yet. It hasn't gone into its uh, funding phase yet. Um, but yeah, this, like it says, it has a, a community mode. So if your phone has attached to the robot by utilizing the phone's cameras and Bluetooth connection of the three dot board, you can control your robot from a computer anywhere in the world. Um, but yes, this is this seems like a very, very nice project. Um, they have actually shown off a few uh, robots that they have made with the board already. Um, and it's yeah, it's just seems so nice it just seems like such a well thought out idea um, there's a lot of different options for this and I can see this uh, being used in a lot of projects one other nice thing to note is that um, much like the Arduino project they are going to be open sourcing the hardware um, which means that um, if you didn't want to buy a board directly from them although I can't really think why you wouldn't um, you could actually just look up this schematic and uh, make one yourself um, but yeah, needless to say, when this one does go live, I will be supporting it. There will be a link to this one in the description, and I will be sure to update you when this goes live and is available. That's it for this week's Electromaker Show. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, please let me know what you think of the show in the comments section below. You will automatically be entered into a mystery box competition. And uh, also, let me know what kind of things you're working on. I'm always interested to know what the community is working on as a whole, and I'm always looking for things to feature on this show. So if you do have something you'd like me to take a look at, leave it in the comments section, or even better, head to the Electromaker website and make an account there. But for now, I hope you have a fantastic week. Stay healthy, stay creative, and I'll see you next week.